Hello, welcome to Vibration Cinema, the alter destiny of film. Today, we are back to our channel series about black image making, eyes and teeth, this time covering trauma porn. I find the general discourse on trauma porn to be very confusing. It's an ill-defined concept and its goalposts never stop moving. It's hard to tackle because of this, but I think its malleability indicates certain things. First, trauma porn reveals more about an individual viewer and their sensibilities than it does about a particular film or trend, because what is traumatic and what is pornographic is a matter of personal taste. For example, the most popular review of Barry Jenkins's Underground Railroad is a tirade against the asceticization of brutality wrought against slaves. Interestingly though, the reviewer cites Haile Garima Sankofa in a list of movies that, quote, pays respect to the scenarios and analyses of slavery, liberation, and black life with some integrity and educated historical context. For those of you who don't know or haven't seen, Sankofa has a flippant black female model, Mona, as its protagonist, a pointedly gendered character, which is to say, for example, not only a black woman, but a woman who works in a profession, especially in the 90s, heavily associated with femininity that is considered vacuous, like modeling. By contrast, she is not of a nobler profession like a nurse, nor is the protagonist a black male in a similarly vacuous occupation like a ball player or a rapper. Mona is apparently so far gone that she must experience the whip and slave rape, staple targets of the anti-trauma brigade by the way, in order to understand why taking fashion photos in front of the door of no return is a stupid idea. And it's only after that she is raped that she becomes fully invested in revolting against her newfound station. I see nothing educated nor of integrity about this setup. Kara Keeling in her book, The Witch's Flight, reads Sankofa more sharply than I do. If you are going to boldly proclaim that the look and feel of Railroad is for the sole purpose of beautifying and trivializing black history and the suffering of black people for a disingenuous entitled audience of predatory revisionist white liberals, then I think at the very least you should spend as much energy intra-communally critiquing disingenuous charlatans and black men who brutalize and trivialize the history and suffering of black women along old school conservative black nationalist lines, especially since black women have been constantly defined by this trope through the lens of quote, common sense black nationalism, unquote, that Kara Keeling critiques in The Witch's Flight. The way people wave their morality sticks in the air would have you believe that they'd at least be consistent, which in some sense they are, if they don't like the movie, no matter how tame it is, it's always trauma porn, which is always bad. If they did enjoy the watch, it's revolutionary agitprop, no matter how brutal. There's generally a strong tendency for people to emphasize the inclusion of trauma rather than defining the threshold of what is pornographic. I think this has more to do with obsessing on how white people might perceive such trauma rather than considering the ways in which it could be productive for black audiences and what can be gleaned from a particular representation of trauma. It has to be exhausting being haunted by the Sasquatch, Godzilla, King Kong, Loch Ness, Goblin, Ghoul, a zombie with no conscience known as trauma porn. But behind the mask of the Scooby-Doo villain is none other than old man respectability. If you engage with these anti-trauma porn rants on YouTube and on Twitter threads, it becomes very clear that the obsession with the white gaze is as strong with them as it is the movies that they critique. There is something to be said, of course, and to be aware of the historical commodification of black death and especially how gleefully white people continue to enjoy such terror. But that doesn't mean we have to dismiss a film in which a black person so much as stubs their toe. But what these bozos can't fathom is that you can make work dealing with trauma that can be uh, for general audiences but retain a specificity for black audiences which does not register with non-black viewers. I wanna draw a parallel between this and lesbian sex scenes to make the point a little clearer. Because you know lesbian, we are, awesome, we are used by pornography, by straight pornography, uh, so the women are afraid to, to be used by this kind of movie. But if they feel the, the sex between women is real, it's, it's something like, you know, it's a female fantasy, so they feel comfortable and even for a professional actress, it can be interesting to, to do. An exchange of desire and power um, between two individuals and, and sort of hooking in. I think when I work with my actors and to make them connect, um, there's something about going behind the eyes when you look at somebody and if you're able to do that in a scene, with, with physical, you know, 
your, you know, your physical sexual body, or just, again, your eyes or um, hands or whatever. I think there's a certain physicality about, you know, uh, going behind the eyes and, and, and really looking intense, intensely at somebody and, and hooking in. So to have it as a, a sexual act with, you know, vagina, vagina, pussy, you know, at anus or whatnot um, is one example of it, and you're right. Um, but I think because the word sex is so complicated in our culture that we immediately put the flesh in there. So, um, yeah, sex could be eating, you know, food or something like that. So, yeah. Well, I, I mean, what you're talking about is erotic scenes, but like, through actually an actual sex scene, I think it has to have sex in it. Does it? For it to be called a sex scene. Well, what is sex, though? Uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, have people having sex with each other in terms of. What kind of things? Blowjobs, fucking, sucking. I think that's just so uh, simple. That's a simple no, kind but of I'm just saying. Like I'm cutting around uh, because I can't find the whole panel um, from that gay film festival on occupied Palestinian land in its entirety anymore. But Emily Jovet and Cheryl Denny uh, discuss creating lesbian sex scenes that can titillate lesbian audiences but not register as sexual to straight men. I think this is a more productive conversation to have. We should be allowed to express our thoughts and feelings on all kinds of traumas we experience artistically and we can interpolate black audiences in a way that doesn't register to white people in the way that lesbian directors use strategies in which lesbians can be erotic on screen for lesbians while mitigating the corrupting male gaze. As an example of this, uh, using trauma porn specifically, I think about the difference AJ notes about 12 Years a Slave and the butler. See, like say for example, one of my critiques of uh, 12 Years a Slave was again, specifically around Patsy. Lapita's beautiful, she's a great actress. Yeah, sure enough. It's kind of undeniable on a certain level. But the characterization is flawed. I think it's a profoundly flawed characterization. Um, the way, and I have a close friend who really got angry at me when I said this, when I said, well, I don't really think the way she's responding to her brutalization doesn't, it doesn't ring true to me. Like even in a film that I think is poorly made, and I don't think he's as talented a filmmaker, the butler, it has a rape scene. And what I like about it, if you can like anything about a rape scene, but what I did like about it is it's a scene where Mariah Carey plays um, the slave. I guess she's enslaved, and she has her husband there and her kids, and the master comes out, and he is very low-key. It's not extravagant. There's nothing operatic about it like in 12 Years a Slave. He just comes and takes her hand to rape her, right? Now, the thing I liked about that rendering was it made clear that this is an everyday thing. This is no super dramatic thing that's happened. I'm not saying it's not dramatic, but I'm saying it's an everyday thing. And what I saw in Mariah Carey's performance in that moment that I thought was interesting was the way in that moment where she had been raped, was about to be raped, and assumed she was gonna be raped again in the future, that what she was doing was thinking. She was thinking hard. She was like managing the situation. But in this one scene, what I really, what I, well, I liked it. I like, I said, well, you know, this is the person saying, well, this is gonna go down. And what she's doing is managing the survival of her husband in that moment. She's like, I'm gonna be raped. He can't stop me from being raped. I can't stop me from being raped, but I can try to spin the situation so that it doesn't spill over into him doing something that's gonna have him killed, have me killed, and have our kids unprotected to whatever degree you can protect your kids under the circumstances. And I like that compared to Patsy, who I thought was infantilized. Well, yeah, uh, totally, totally passive. With the, with the passive and with the dolls, by the time they cut to the dolls, that's not in the book. But at a certain point, they, well, they asked initially, Lapita, well, what did Steve McQueen tell you? She said, he only told me one thing, that Patsy was simple. She said, that's the only direction he gave me, that she was simple. Now, I don't think that exists. I don't think there's a such thing as a simple person who's enslaved. I think that's an impossibility. These scenes are both considered trauma porn despite being radically different. And key to this difference is the routine mundanity in the butler, which in some sense makes it more insidious even though the rape is only hinted at as opposed to the spectacle set piece McQueen turns his rape scene into. 
And as AJ notes, we as black audiences can pick up on the interiority of Mariah Carey's character, whereas the white viewer might not pick up on these subtleties. But McQueen infantilizes Lupita's character here so much that I think it's hard for any black person to recognize her. But that simpleness, which is ever present in slave tropes, is a familiar and confirming sight for white people. The point here is that the butler can be viewed by white people, but can still also be generative for black people with its subtlety. And we can levy a sharper critique of 12 Years a Slave, not in the spectacle element of the scene, but in the rendering of blackness as inauthentic. These are nuances that the trauma police would lock you up for. Then you have something like Eula Pazan's storyline in Daughters of the Dust, where the film emphasizes the aftermath of her rape. There's a whole genre of rape revenge stories, including Sankofa, in film. But rarely do we see what the process of healing from that is. And that's what's on display in Daughters how her rape affected her, obviously, but the whole family, and how she and her family comes together to show love and support in her process of reconciling such a grave transgression. Daughters happens in the aftermath of slavery, but it's still about the racist sexual violence at the hands of white supremacists in its aftermath. Daughters also uses indigo-stained hands as a metaphor for the lasting effects of slavery. That trauma, not of the whipping post, but of the work itself, is on full display throughout the movie. Even though indigo doesn't stain skin, it is poisonous. More nuance is lost with the trauma brigade. Trauma always seems to be the spectacle of physical and sexual violence. Never the trauma of a bad breakup, never the trauma of a five day work week, never the trauma of not knowing when the next check is coming. Traumas like those can't be rendered as eye candy, so they fly under the radar. But of course, Garima does depict, very viscerally, the trauma of administrative violence. The violence of paperwork, the violence of being put on hold, on his thesis film, Bush Mama. I would argue that the level Grima indulges here in the spectacle of this trauma with such a visceral aesthetic is pornographic. It's intense and unrelenting, it's overemphasizing. It's too much. And in the end of the film, where such an aesthetic is applied to the physical and sexual violence is equally pornographic. But I don't think that's inherently a bad thing. I've always sung Bush Mama's praises and considered among the best movies ever made, but I've also been very fiercely critical of it. Because Bush Mama suffers the same problem as Sankofa. The narrative significance of this physical violence again tells us that black women cannot be radicalized by things like their community showing them alternative futures, they cannot be radicalized by administrative violence, they cannot be radicalized by the state separating their families with the prison system. No. In Garima's worldview, black women become radicalized only when the state perpetuates gendered physical violence against them. It's not the welfare in DCFS pressuring Dorothy to get an abortion or risk losing money that radicalizes her. It has to be cops kicking her to miscarriage while another cop rapes her daughter across town. Only then does the wig come off. Which, not to overstep as a man, but something about the implication that rocking natural hair makes a woman inherently more radical or less colonized is, well something. That violence was depicted in Bush Mama shouldn't be a problem. That the violence is spectacular shouldn't be a problem. The narrative utility of the violence is what should be questioned. The intentionality of Grima's massage noir is the problem, not the presentation of the violence. Trauma porn has become a political mandate, a dogma that doesn't consider nuance and purpose. I think trauma porn should be a constant itch in the back of creative's head an impulse to refine their intentionality. Can I maintain the interiority of my black characters even as the spectacle of violence is rendered against them? Is it necessary to even indulge to this degree? More importantly, the intentionality of a scene and its utility reveal more about the film than something as arbitrary as anyone's personal threshold of what is considered pornographic. One thing that I think is okay to be dogmatic about with regard to trauma is mandating onset counselors and therapists. Uh, it should be a standard practice across the board, regardless of the nature of the show. We have set medics, so we should have set therapists. Personally, with regard to putting actors through it, I wouldn't. 
and there are methods that have been used to protect them on sets like Mysterious Skins about um, CSA. The child actors play a different script and it's cut together in a way that implies inappropriate scenarios. Those could easily be applied to more traumatic scenes, but the lack of support on a set like Lovecraft Country is what ultimately led to the passing of Michael K. Williams. And he he's talked specifically about Lovecraft Country pushing him to therapy for waking up intergenerational demons. And it's so unfortunate that he's been speaking about this, about speaking about being haunted by the trauma of his roles um, as early as 12 Years a Slave, nearly a decade ago. To play the character and get as deep in it as I know you go, was it emotional? Was it hard to shake it at night and when the film was over? It was, it was very hard um, to, sh to, uh, to get into that. There was a scene, unfortunately, it didn't make the film. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, he shoots in, in, in series, which means like he won't yell cut, while the cameras are still running, he'll just go back to one, hurry up again, again. And they were shooting the scene where my, cam my, my, my character Roberts was being dragged to the slave ship and he was revolting. Right. And he was frailing, you know, it's going crazy. And um, around the fifth time that we shot it, you know, Steve yelled, cut, and something came over me. I, I, don't, I don't know what it was, but I, um, I just, I fell to the ground and I, I couldn't stop crying and screaming. I'm like, ah! ah! And, and I couldn't even get up off the floor. It was, um, it was surreal. And uh, the stunt coordinator, he got on the floor with me, a white man, and he, right. he cradled me in his arms, and he rocked me. He kept saying, it's okay, Mike, let it out. Mm -hmm. Let it out. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, man, for like what must have seemed like 15, 20 minutes. And um, like the cloud just passed over me, and I got up, and I was like, okay, let's, let's go. And um, I, I think what happened to me was I, I was given a glimpse into what our ancestors must have uh, went through. Yeah. This industry it killed him, and, and for what? Some shadow puppetry? We can turn off a show like them, but actors carry that weight of their roles long after rap, long after the premiere, because you know our current acting practices focus so much on the real and embodying and because the, turn of the turnaround times don't allow for decompression and release, you know? Um, and this is where the outrage over trauma should be aimed at, you know, at our unsafe work environments, which have already proved lethal.